I'm cold, I'm sitting on the canal, which is not my favourite place. Freezing cold, biting normally wind, but the water's clear and I made a big mistake. I should have bought lures and gone for big perch. That's what I'm looking for. You know, like pound or pound and a half decent sized perch. Um, not one of the angler fishing. Understandable. You see how I wrapped up. Middle of winter. Praying for the spring to come. Still a ways, good ways off. I've got lobworm on one waggler float set out there. I've undershotted the waggler float to allow for the weight of the lobworm. And then I've got some sort of branding size uh, worms or single worm on the other um, waggler float. And there is a flow, but I've, I've got them over depth so they're just barely tripping the bottom in the middle of the channel. I've plumbed the float up, I've chucked some ground weight in, which is. Bit of Baileys, a little bit of Baileys, a little bit heavy duty for canal, I know, but I've still got some left, I don't want to go and buy any more. And some pellet things, which I don't know, they need some pressure pump to work on or something, I don't know. I, I soaked them in hot water, threw them out, and they still floated, so I haven't got a clue what they are. They're these things, they go all squishy and soft, but the damn things float. I need this pressure pump, which I won't be buying. Um, I've chopped up some worms with scissors, throwing those out and I just put the rods down there on the rest basically because as they go along I've got match rods so they're soft so if I get a tape the reels are on very light drag they just pull over if I miss a bite but I'm sat behind the umbrella here trying to keep the wind off me because the wind chill is pretty bad today I'm not hopeful, I feel I'm on a blank but at least I'm out there trying maybe in retrospect red maggots might have done me better but I don't know where I'm fishing don't know where to go. Somebody said go by the church in the town, but I don't like to go in the town yet. You know, a lot of people there and it's not quite the same as it out here. It's a lovely bit of countryside. So, I'll get back to you guys if I do actually uh, get a bite. I'm just waiting for a bite at the moment. And uh, it ain't looking good. Well, I've been here, well I've been here about a bit over an hour, unsurprisingly not a tremor, quiver or dip of the float and back come the three stupid swans up and down and up and down, they are a pain in the bait box not my favourite bird swans, I'm sure a lot of anglers uh, aren't uh, too enthused by them especially when you're baiting up in shallow water and baiting up anywhere in fact more so on a canal, I suppose people feed them bread. So they see five people feed them bread and the sixth one wants to feed them hand grenades. <laughs>
I'm tempted to go and find this church, they told me. It's fished by the church in the town. I don't normally, because I like to keep away from, uh, you know, high-density places if I can. I fish somewhere in the countryside. Oh, and it's raining. I just see on the water this dimpling. Maybe I won't move just yet. But I might get that, because I've got the cart barrel. I might wheel it up in the town and actually have to fish somewhere around to find this church. I've got religion. See if I can't have a couple of hours up there. I was going to move at two o'clock. Oh, straight through the lines, this one. They're stupid, they are incredibly stupid. Just gone ten to one. Um, I think I'm going to give it a two o'clock. I think I'll make a move, and that gives me about a couple of hours before it gets dusk, and I might pick something up. But again, I don't know where to go. Just I met a guy at another fisher, and he said, Oh, fish up by the church. Loads of perch. Oh, yeah, okay. Loads of swans. Well, I've moved about a good half a mile, maybe more, upstream looking for this church that this guy uh, told me to fish near for perch. I've got nothing down the other end. There's a lot more boat traffic here and here comes one now. <laughs> so I'm not having much luck. Every time they open the locks, it puts a big swell on the water and it moves up and down. So one minute the float's moving through, the next minute it's not. So this is going to stir it all up again. Well, I fear it's surely got to be after that boat's gone through a blank today. And I came because I thought it's winter. Who's going out in a horrible northerly wind? There's already been two boats up and down. I thought there'd be no canal boats at all. But I think when they open the locking, they put a draw on the water as it goes down. Then they close and it stops. So one minute your float's going through the way, and then it's stopping and goes back the other way. Maybe it's down to the last hour. I don't know. I don't even know if I'm in the right spot. Find the church, can't get closer to the church, there's a cemetery. Big church too. No bites, people, but even though the gentleman told me, fish up by the church going, loads of perch. Well, I'm not catching loads of perch, but looking along here, got 200 yards. Well, where in the 200 yards did I fish? So I've gone along looking for where marks and where other anglers have put their rod rest, you know, because obviously it's right in the town, it's going to get hammered. And then I happened to look up, and then I saw, ah, a pole float up in the tree. That tells me at least. I am in a spot that another angler's fished, so I'm sort of happy enough where I am. I still like to see the float go down, but at least I'm sort of not in no man's land where there's no fish. Well, there could be no fish, but obviously somebody else has fished here and it's all trees over the top, so a very tricky place to fish. Well, although I've walked all this way up here, I'm going to give it about an hour, hour and a half, uh, because when I walked up, there's only one area below a big uh, lock sluice that I saw, and it looked like there's some little bubbles coming up. There could have been skimmer bream. So I'm gonna go back down there for the last sort of hour in the evening. Finally, I've lost another one, and I've just got one literally within minutes of each other. A bit tight for the, uh, let's turn this around for you. Save the blank, save the blank people. Got the perch and that's on the lobworm and the other one I lost was on a, on a brandling so 
I might just stay here now, it just goes to show the guy was right, there are perch here by the church and then I spotted that float up in the tree and that was a sort of banker so I'm going to sit it on this one now it's literally within two minutes I got these fish one on a lobworm and the other small one which I couldn't film, I couldn't get the camera on in time um, that was on a branding or oh, close run thing on a cold winter's day I want to get in folks, I haven't even caught, I've still got the worm here in my hand and then I just saw the line pulling tight in the other one, he's let go as well, happy days. What I don't understand is how they suddenly come on like this, but I'm grateful and that's what I'm doing, I'm cutting the lobworm in half there, there you can see it just there. Well, just those uh, three perch hooked up. Bizarre. I'm in the same area, and they all came within, honestly, three to four minutes. It's really cold with the wind now, so I think I'm going to move up here. There's some bushes, and I've seen up in the tree. Just had to walk along and had a quick look. There's another spot right by that um, barge there, and it's you, you could just see a little bit of fishing line hanging there. There's some overhanging trees there. The thing is with the canals, they're shallow, right? They're, not deep in the middle, let's say four feet in the middle, but it curves up. That's where the boats go right down the middle, making it a little bit deeper. So generally, I'd want to be fishing under those trees for the perch, but the trouble is it's going to be about this deep, because it curves up. And it could be in there, but somehow I doubt it. But I think I'm going to move up there, because I'll get really cold now. Finally got another one on just before it's moved. Just after I've thrown the bait all in up there. Oh, it's just a better fish, it's a netter. Oh yes, result. This is what I came for. Nice, decent sized perch. There we go. Nice, decent sized perch, this one, guys. Just about get that hook out. Hang on a minute, wait, we get it out. Got the hook out, oh, got it out. And there we go. Put his fin up for you as well. Can't ask any better than that. We even got boat going past at the same time. On again people. Almost the same spot. Smaller perch this time. So the man was right when he said there's so many perch in here when they shoal up it pushes the water out the canal down the slope and fills up and floods the church courtyard. Well, perhaps there's not that many there, but there are. Nice sized perch. The last two have been on uh, on Brandling. I'm, I'm going both both ones with the Brandling now. Another small one, I'll come back to the other swim. I'll try it up there by the barge. Another small one, I'll come back to the other swim. I'll try it up there by the barge. It's getting not so much to the five minute warning, to the hypothermic warning. I can't take much more. Sunset. It's not long away, about 20, 15, 20 minutes. 
I've had another perch. I had a wonderful time with it. I don't know what it was, half a pound. I think you saw it on the camera. I was hooking it up. I went to try and swing it in here. The rod top went around the tree. I gave that a little jerk and the perch went flying up the tree and just tangled around it. So I've had to extend the landing net, get up, pull it all down, unhook the perch, put it in the water, then snap the branch for trying to get all my gear back, which I have, and I've put it back in the water and I'm catching nothing. Kind of surprised because I thought there would be perch around, you know, last minute like this, but I'll give you another 15 minutes. Once that sun goes down, it'll get even colder than it is now. It's biting normally. And about three people come past it. I must be mad fishing in this. Hello, float's gone. False alarm. False alarm just dragged under, and the ripple's gone the other way. Can't put an umbrella up because one minute's blowing this way, next minute's blowing that way. A little bit of bait left to throw in and that's about it and I'm uh, going to call it quits after that. Would have been nice to get a really big perch, two pounds upwards but just the way it is. I should be grateful I've brought four or five perch now. Still chance for one more. It's a good one, let me get the net. Snockings. Oh, hook <laughs> pinged out. There's the worm. Really nice perch. Look at this one. Goodness me. I mean, it's turned into a good session, isn't that, eh? Look at that one. Beautiful tail on it. And this is me early on saying I don't like fishing canals. I've changed my mind. Well, let's get this guy back. Well, please. I think I'm going to have to hang on as cold as it is. I mean, I'm still catching fish. I haven't seen one other angle on the whole stretch. Let's get this fish back. Oh, what a setting too. The water is so clear, I thought I've got to come back with some lures. Look at that one, peeps. Gone. Do you know what, at the end of the day, I've always professed not to be a great lover of canals, but I sort of quite enjoyed that, apart from the cold. You know me and the cold. I don't believe it. I'm waiting for the spring. I'm fed up with the cold weather. I wake up this morning, pull back the curtains, and I get this. It might be pretty to some people, but it stops me fishing. It does happen. It's just that it's really annoying because in the UK as I make this little film, the river seasons are going to close in, what's the date? Six days time. Six days, no river fishing for three months. Unless you want to go fly fishing for trout in rivers, etc. I've got one little problem. I've got my lovely warm leather gloves that Mike, Mike bought me. These, what do they call them? We mentioned them before. Hestra, Hestras, really nice. I'm going to need them in this weather, so I've got two things going to be using out there. These gloves, but in close up, although I put this balm, the leather balm, to soften them up, you take a look, it's got all this white stuff on it. You can see, it's got all like this stuff on it, which, which, which can rub. But now I phone Mike up, he's off out shooting somewhere. 
He said, get a hairdryer and soften it up. He said, it's like a sort of paraffin wax there. So I'm going to try that and see if I can soften it and then polish it as well. He said, put the glove on like this. Now I can stretch the leather tight and I can rub that softened wax properly into the glove, make them really supple. Now, I've been frightened to use this because I'm terrible for wearing gloves out because I use a lot of physical work. And he said, no, these will take a lot of battery. They are almost work gloves for woodland stuff as well. Now you can see, that's definitely got softened all the wax that's amazing, isn't it? They see what little do Every day is different in life, and they always try and learn something. All this old school stuff. Look at that. Absolutely. Helps keep it supple. Keeps, keeps Uncle Graham's fingers warm. I can take, but I'm not going to be using these when I've been putting squid on the hook. And the squid goes all inside on the uh, wool. No sorry. Finish these and I'll show you the next thing for the cold snow weather. Here we go guys, come up really nice. Good tip from Mike from Tear Outdoors. Get hair dry, if you do get that wax on it softens it, keeps them supple. That's the hands taken care of for the cold weather, but what about the feet? Now, some time ago, I don't know, a month ago, on one of the films I must have mentioned I hate the cold and I do. And uh, one, two, at least three different guys came on the comments and said, Graham, get yourself to Aldi supermarket and get yourself a pair of their neoprene Wellingtons. You will not look back. I go to Aldi's, they've sold out. I phone up, Whoa, we don't know when we get any more into. Look, I, I've got to have a pair because three different people, presumably of age similar to myself or thereabouts, can't all be wrong, can they? And we're not, we're not selling them. I don't have shares in Aldi Supermarket. It's just, these guys obviously said these are good and they're quite cheap. So, last week's film, I think it was, one of the guys came back on, he gave me the tip. He said, Graham, don't tell anybody, but Aldi have got some of those neoprene Wellingtons in again. <coughs> I'm over there. There's a few left. I get them. Look. No, they're not free. I'm not no sponsor, guys. £24, whatever, and some nuts and bolts. I'm going to look forward to wearing these because, look, I've got, I've got neoprene chest waders, so I know how nice and soft and supple that they are. But these, I guess they just look like Wellingtons at the end. I've got ones big enough that I can still put two pairs of socks on in the cold. I need two pairs. And it's just neoprene. I'm guessing, I don't know, somebody tell me, what are the properties of neoprene? Is it the fact the neoprene keeps my upper calf and leg warm, thereby the blood supply can get down to my feet and keep my feet warm? Is that how these neoprene Wellington works? Look, anybody wants some? Good luck finding them because they must get them in and, and then sell them out pretty quickly. So I've got these. I've got my gloves. Even better, I've got these. These are the supports they come with. Now this, surely, as a child of the 1950s, can make a pretty substantial bang. I feel there's only one thing to do with these, as a child. How loud will it go? The worst in the other room, if I go outside and stamp on them from a great height. It's got to be done, it's got to be done. Gloves, all these nice neoprene boots, I'm um, all tucked up nicely indoors, going to be going outdoors, probably going to try and squeeze one more piking session in. I want to get out really to try pike fishing, 
almost before the snow melts, because the snow melt goes in the rivers, generally kiss of death, you know, it's going to kill it, and as I say, there's very few days left in the river season. But with this snow, I've mentioned before, we don't have many birds. Well, the fat balls we put out have just been ripped off by the rooks. The rooks have been moved on. So we've got the small birds out there now. There was loads of them this morning because I guess they know this cold weather's here. And I wonder, are they feeding that hard around the bird feeders that they know some more snow is coming? Because years ago, the old saying was, if the snow hangs around, there's more coming. We'll find out later on this afternoon. Okay. Oh, I suppose we will. We'll get a little bit more dusting. Over here in the UK, you know guys who are in the Yukon or Alaska or Siberia or somewhere, fall around laughing when they see our country come to a halt with two inches of snow. But it's the truth. I'm sure we don't have too many snow plows or snow blowers as they do in places like Canada where they're gilded. You, know, you guys are all geared up to it. You know what you're doing over there. But interesting about those birds, I don't know why it's been such a peculiar year, but I literally... I put a fat ball out, I put some peanuts out, I put some bird seed out in the feeders within 10 minutes. There were loads that came. So why did they not come in them when it's, when, it's, when it's not cold? I don't understand that. Is it something to do with the bird flu? Now I also was told that the foxes are in a bit of a decline because, not the urban ones so much, but the country foxes because they are eating the dead carcasses of birds that have died naturally in the wild environment that have got bird flu and the foxes are dying from it. I've even heard otters apparently have been dying because they've been eating dead infected birds with bird flu. It's a shame isn't it? Anyway guys, I'm going to find out something else to do. What can I think I'm going to have to do? Yeah. Oh, I wanted to tell you about other comments I had which was guys saying, Graham you really ought to make some compost because you've got that massive amount of leaves that I put in an old fish pond uh, that was leaking. Um, so I used it just as a sort of dumping ground for the leaves to rock down there. And they said, make your own compost. Well, I've also got a log burner and I started using more and more dried, super dried logs. So I'm in the greenhouse. Um, you probably see me logging, sawing, hacking, everything. And of course, Mike on TA Outdoors now has his very own woodland and we'll get deadfall down there which we can chainsaw up, chop up, and we won't be buying any more logs. I don't buy any more logs anyway, but generally burn whatever I can get a hold of. In the next year or two, it will be Mike's logs. But I've got quite a few here. I've got at least about two years worth of stock anyway from my own property. So what I did was get the wood, do they call that potash? The wood ash from the fire. Now I'm not just going to put that straight over the garden because it's got staples or nails in it. So I get, again, Mike's giant magnet that we used to go magnet fishing with and I run that backwards and forwards through the ash just picking up those big nails. After I've done that, I pull them off and put them in the rubbish bin. Been saving every penny for to make up through the fall. Working for that dollar, but it never adds up at all. But coming around the river banker, the old train was so sane. The very next thing you hear from me, I've been tied to a ball and chain. I then level it all out and get a 14 pound sledgehammer and I pound it to oblivion, just bang it up and down. So I crunch it all down, even the big bits, which are sort of black chickens, if you like, look like charcoal, really, grind them all down. I'll be back in Tennessee Playing cards and crap games, not looking for the score And if I ever get back home again, I'll never own no Good. 
good time, boys, listen to my song. May not go better, but I know you know. When I've done that, I go down the bottom of the garden where I've actually got a big area that we used to put grass cuttings on from the last 10 to 15 years. Now, I was told grass cuttings are one of the last ones to break down for compost, whereas the leaves might go a bit quicker. Somebody in the garden won't tell me. Nevertheless, I'm just going to let this clip run on. It's all self-explanatory. It's how I made my own compost. And brilliant, saved me money. So this year later on, when we get the summer, if the summer eventually comes, you will see, hopefully, beautiful flowers, better than any garden in Britain. Who knows? This is how I did it. Been saving every penny for to make up through the fall. Working for that dollar, but it never adds up at all. Coming around the river banker, the old train was so sane. The very next thing you hear from me, I've been tied to a ball and chain. Well, come this time tomorrow, reckon I don't know where I'll be. But if it wasn't for that old sheriff, I'd be back in Tennessee. Playing cards and crap games, not looking for the score. And if I ever get back home again, I'll never own no Boys, listen to my song. May not know better, but I know you know right from wrong. Buy yourself a postcard. Well, the other problem I got are old, very old um, window box type things I've made, and you can see, look, they've rotted out. I'm not surprised they've been there years. So I actually did have, as you can see, that's really done. Some lovely big long. Yes, you know what it's going to be. Pallet board, 16 feet long. The new world record pallet, and that's ideal for one big run like that. So I've ripped out um, the old um, troughs there, and I've rebuilt brand new ones. Stain them up, so it all tones down. It's pallet wood. It does take a bit of stain. It soaks up well. You know, it does soak up pallet wood. It's no question. It's a, it's what, I guess, what, I don't know, pine, whatever they make them out of. And some of the plants, these are called silver sultans. These probably are 15 years old. They reseed, but they're from original plants. See the lights of town. Find yourself a country girl. Keep quiet and sit old. Finally, having done all that work in the garden, I did get one spell where I could go up and help Mike doing some log cutting up in his woodland. So if you want to see Mike's stuff, woodland, outdoors, bushcraft type stuff, go across to our sister channel, T8 Outdoors. I don't know what he's got, 2.4 million subscribers or something crazy. You can check it out, it's just easy to watch stuff. A lot of you guys I know that follow the awesome army fishing. Also, skip over to Mike's channel and see what he's putting up as well. But I really enjoyed my little trips up there with him. And this time, I actually got to chop up the wood and light the fire. Yes, flames. We've actually finished uh, quite a bit of the camp up there. So Mike's making a film for TA Outdoors. I'm trying to get some wood together here using my trusty old ancient antique knife. But there were some marks out in the woodland when I went walking there and I just want to see what they are. Yeah, and I think I might be, I mean, might be right, it's creeping here. Not that we're spooking anything. 
I reckon this is a bedding down place just here. Maybe somebody tells us that for digging or something dug that out. But I have seen muntjac under these holly bushes before. Not this particular holly bush, but in previous woodlands. Normally, you know, late in the evening, because I'm not exactly an early morning person. But this is all really big holly area that Mike's got on the woodland. But that's a classic for muntjac, which are, I believe are a sort of independent single deer. And you can see there's loads of loads of giant trees in this particular section. Hang on, look. Are these bedding down areas? Now look there. What is that? Is that one, two, three prints there? Is that a wolverine? I don't see deer prints, but something's packed that down and pushed on that. Rates it away to lay on it, I feel. Goes over here. Scuffling around a little bit. Always interesting. Just looking around these areas. The creature, I don't know if you guys are going to see this. See where the leaves are disturbed? Something's gone through this way. Oh, here we go. Is that rabbit droppings or deer droppings or what? Creature droppings, wolverine droppings. It's droppings, but you can see how it's been dug out. Who is the doo-doo expert that can tell us what that pile of shh is? I'm part hunter, really. You can tell that the one I'm tracking. Just look for leaf marks that have been disturbed. Okay, it's been disturbed there. Stretch out to there, to there. Now, deer people will know. I think that's a walking deer, not a running deer. So that's not one I've spooked just now. I feel that's one that's probably been just walking through the woods here. There, see the leaf turned over there. There again. I mean, I've not done an overnight or anything uh, and seen much myself. It's generally been at dawn or dusk when creatures come out. You hear Mike chopping more ho ho hollies there, and I'm sure they get under that as well. It's all interesting. Oh, Mike's chopping wood, I can hear it back there, way in the distance. Very, very quiet today. Very quiet. I don't see anything through the distance on the other guy's property through there. Can you see that? I'm pretty sure that's where. Maybe a deer's bedding down. Deer people tell us. Answers on a postcard. So this is work. Standard procedure with the awful ivy goes up the trees look it is horrible stuff the mites segmented that one and cut cut it apart so the top dies off as you can see it goes all the way up there this is what I think is killing loads of trees all dead stuff look. it does still cling to the tree even when it's dead shame because they're big trees so that's standard forestry management Kill it off there. Oh, it's interesting. Loads of bird droppings here. Now, would that be a raptor tree where the buzzard comes? Who knows? We have actually got... Oh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a nest up in that tree there. Not big enough to be a buzzard, I don't feel. Yeah, we're going to have to put out an overflow on that because... Dad's bit of gluing here or whatever's holding up. And uh, water butt there. A guttering, that's worked a treat. In fact, it's overflowed onto the top here. So really, if he's gonna keep this, is to, you know, run out an excess pipe to run the surplus off, or you can just drain it down. There we go. I'm kind of amazed that's not frozen. Yeah. I believe this will be the start of the wild garlic coming through. And Mike's piece of woodland is absolutely a carpet around this area. In the springtime, 
of bluebells and I've got some beautiful footage of the wild garlic here that's growing up. In fact you can see just down there all these shoots. So doing this in January, end of January and when you see that you know there's another one look just there. Even when you see little things like that where we've had a horrendously awful cold my fingers are frozen type of winter and you guys know I hate the cold it's nice to see that. It's nice to see that there is a bit of regeneration coming, giving you hope for warmer weather and springtime. Here is uh, now. Just, just don't get shocked when I say this. This is, I believe, here, Dalvinia concentrica. Is it? I do believe that's correct. Is it King Alfred's cake or fungus or something? And it only grows on the ash. Michael, tell me if I got this totally wrong. Sounds very black. Is that softer? Yeah, that's softer. Oh man, that's hard. And that's a fungus, I believe, that they use for lighting fire. In fact, I'm pretty sure I know it is. That one. Dry it out. You dry it out and you can... Oh, look, it's everywhere. And mostly... I don't know, sure, I think it only grows on ash, but there's plenty there. And being a boy, I've got to take this back and put it on the fire and watch it glow. Here is a tree that uh, we had Ryan the tree surgeon. If you follow Mike's channel on TA Outdoors, you'll see when he first bought the woodland, cutting down some uh, dead wood and stuff like that. I'm trying to drop my King Alfred's cakey thingy, whatever. Fairy cakes, or whatever they call them. Up there, we got Ryan to climb right up that um, dead post there and put, uh, hopefully, a buzzard nest up there. But I can't see anything on there at the moment, no movement. Hopefully in the future we get something on that. How Ryan goes up that tree, I mean it's beyond me. It's pretty interesting to watch. Yeah, what's rotten? <laughs> They take a while to light this fire light just because it's wet.
So we're going to ask the master who's chopping up the master log splitter. What is it? Well, in my many years of doing bushcraft, folks, I believe I might have in my hand Dalvinia concentrica. Close. Daldinia concentrica. And her. So you've got a... Both together they were. Yeah, so brown like that, not ready yet. I bet yeah. that's rock hard. If yeah, you... absolutely. Right, so that's, off a log. that's this season's. That's not ready. Yeah. That's actually almost a bit far gone. It's yes. crumbly. Yeah. But it, we've also had wet weather. But that's what you want, black. The black so is they, the drying. They call it for, they call it the coal fungus yeah. because it looks like coal. Isn't it King, King Alfred's tea King cakes? King Alfred's cakes because back in, uh, whatever it was, King Alfred days, 12th century or something like that, he uh, rumoured when the Vikings were trying to attack the Danes, sorry, he was down in Somerset, they somewhere in the in the, uh, the Somerset levels, and they were hiding out from the Danish army, and he was helping the peasants and things like that cook food and the cakes. He wasn't on the front lines as such, and rumours it. Ru the rumour is that he uh, burnt the cakes, and that's why they call it King Alfred Cakes, because... Yeah. That's not burning now, them. it's got to be dried, isn't it? Yeah, that's definitely got to be dried. Okay. I just stick it on a radiator. The the spores come out of it as well. So. The being a boy of the 50s, I want to see if it burns. Oh, that's better for my hands. That's warm now, isn't it? Though? Yeah, lovely. You need to. My hands are frozen. doing some forestry work now if you want to see what we've been doing today go over to Mike's channel TA Outdoors I think the film's going up maybe after this one have a look we've got a load of ash kindling you can see lots of ash kindling there and uh, fires out we've had tea and stuff that's all out lovely and warm and that thing's come out in case anybody wants to google it it's called the sun and it gives off something called warmth so quite a good day in the woods it's always a, a struggle you know trying to get everything done in the day i've enjoyed it i always like you know get the fire going so check mike's channel ta outdoors and you can see what we've been up to replenishing the forest is what i'm going to call it and uh done, we've done enough digging anyway for a while lots of different stuff going on um i'm getting back to either the uh well tackle shack no uh, maybe go in the office I'll see you guys back there. I know you'll drive faster than I do, so you'll get there before me. There you go, random put together film. Look outside the door, guys, with that snow. I can do no more than put up what I put up, and that's it. We'll see you in the next one, hopefully, some nice big fat fish. See you then.